so um, Dr. Pollard, I'm going to start with you because Eric has just been talking about community college. Mm. Um, you are the president <laughs> of Maryland's largest college system. Mm -hmm. But what's amazing about your commitment is that it's not just focused on students in Montgomery County. It literally spans the globe. Tell us about some of the innovative uh, partnerships that you have going on right now, uh, what they look like, how they've come to fruition, how you forge those relationships with the business community. Mm. So let's talk a little bit about the work, and I appreciate the question, Elizabeth, because I, I was very struck by our, our speaker who set the stage and talked about this responsibility for higher education extending, uh, not just in terms of those who deliver the education, but those who receive the education. And I'm often reminded of a quote that I heard not too long ago that says that higher education was a movement before it was a series of buildings to be managed. And when you think about the idea of a, of a movement, I often think about the impact of that movement and what it's supposed to have in the broader community. Uh, Montgomery College, I think, is very much embracing this idea that higher education, uh, dare I say, the right and access to higher education is indeed a movement. Uh, we have three campuses serving over 60,000 students in, in Montgomery County, and we do that with pride, but we do that both in terms of trying to ensure that we have strong partnerships to meet the workforce needs of those who have a very clearly defined educational pathway, but also those who are still trying to figure it out. So when I think about some of the things that we do and the things that I think we do well, we do that by sitting down and listening very closely to what the workforce is telling us. As it was described earlier, the best partnerships are ones in which you actually have something that there's a, uh, an exchange that occurs, an exchange that says that I have something that I can provide to you, and at the same time, you have something that can be provided to me, and how do we build upon that in a way to really build a strong partnership? So we've done that in several areas, and I'll talk about a few. Uh, obviously, I could not start without uh, talking about the one we have with Discovery. Uh, and I, this wasn't a, a paid endorsement, so I'll say this very clearly. <laughs> I, I say it with great pride, because what we're doing with the Discovery Education is actually rather phenomenal, both in terms of the unique partnership this entity, Discovery itself, has with Montgomery College. And, uh, coming and doing lectures for our students, talking about how a student is more marketable in the workplace, having very specific conversations about the skills and environment in which a student will work, go into when they complete, in addition to providing internships and, and actually hiring some of our students as well. That, I think, is very exciting. And the work we're doing right now in India and taking this very thoughtful idea of how community colleges can educate and prepare vocationally minded students to go into the type of work that we referenced earlier. So that type of partnership, I think, is, is phenomenal. Uh, we're also doing things at the local level with uh, companies that in Montgomery County define themselves as the knowledge industry. So we've partnered with uh, large and small pharmaceuticals, and we have a series of degree programs that are very exciting. Uh, biotechnology uh, is a growing field in Montgomery County, dare I say, in the state of Maryland. And what we're doing very clearly is to sit down and have direct conversations with MedImmune, Human Genome Sciences, and we're finding out what do you need to have in order to have entry-level workers. And what they were telling us, we can hire PhDs from all over the world and that's what they're doing, who can come in and work in biotechnology, but what they recognize is they didn't have people who were bench skill workers to support those who are actually producing the science. Somebody's got to get in there and pour the test tube. Somebody's got to get in there and actually document the research, and those are the type of workers that we're preparing. But here's the part that's interesting about that. If you look at our program we have right now in biotechnology, the majority, the majority of the people in the program, over 50% 50, 50 already have a bachelor's degree. Some have a master's degree. And they're coming back and finding out there's a very powerful educational exchange that's occurring that this degree that they thought they had was going to get them a certain job or a certain mm -hmm. skill set really isn't a commodity anymore. And now they're coming back and they're seeking degrees in our program. And a certificate can lead to an associate's degree and move into the field. That, to me, is a very exciting program that we have. Uh, Amorex, a local company, has come to us and partnered with us to create a clinical trials manager, someone who actually has, again, a degree in another area, but who's working in the science field. They're actually running clinical trials. But they needed someone to understand the operational parts of that. But you think about community colleges, though, and I believe this deeply, uh, we are potentially the most transformative entity in contemporary America. Uh, we are serving those who have and those who have not. We're serving the honor student, and we're serving the student who's learning how to read more effectively. Uh, we serve those who have a very clear idea about their path and those who have no idea about their path. So as a result of that, 
the, the strength of what we do is deeply connected to the community that we serve. I think about the work we're doing with hospitals and providing RNs and, and training uh, the whole allied health profession. A Holy Cross Hospital, a local entity here, we're actually the first community college in the country to open a science park on our campus, and we are building a hot, working with a partner to build a hospital on that campus. Mm -hmm. But the beauty of that is not just the fact that we are leasing them land. The beauty of that is that we're providing them workers who are going to be the phlebotomists, the surgical technologists, the RN. That to me is the beauty of what community colleges do because we know for a fact if our community is not thriving, we don't thrive as an institution. There's a mutuality to that dependence. So uh, I'm very proud of that type of work. And there are always challenges, which I think is probably another big question we'll talk about mm -hmm. later. But I, I think that work is critical to the survival of a community. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Shannon, so uh, Dr. Pollard is talking a lot about the community and these deep relationships at a local level. You are the social responsibility leader for the world's largest accountancy and consulting firm, PricewaterhouseCoopers. And you've spearheaded the Earn Your Future initiative, which for those who aren't familiar is a $160 million commitment that PwC has made that will uh, really invest in financial literacy and youth education. And it has a goal of reaching 2.5 million students and educators over the next five years. Shannon, how do you take something that is <laughs> Of that scale, so big. yeah, <laughs> and and really create. What does that look like at the local community level? Well, I think one of the things that's so important, and, and different people have certainly touched on it. We can't do this alone, right? We we can sit here as a corporation, and we can give dollars, and we can give a lot of resources, and that's something that's very valuable. But we don't know how to get into the education system. We don't know what that looks like to actually sit alongside a superintendent or a principal or a teacher to get into community college versus four-year college. What we can do, and I think what we've recognized is there's something that we can, but we need kind of pointed in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And so when we looked at making the significant commitment, it was with a lot of research saying, where could we play and what made sense? But also, were there enough partners that are out there, both at the national level, who can help to kind of lay the land and say that this is something that's possible and something that is meaningful, and just not another commitment that's out there, but one that is five years in the making and, and really can have some um, reporting and, and really meaningful, just like we do within a, the accounting profession, but then also to take a look and say, who's on the ground? Because it's great to have this national commitment. We really felt that it was something that was important not to do it state by state, school by school, but to say, this is all in. So 37,000 people in the US, this is what they do. They teach financial literacy, and they have to work with partners to get into the schools. We have national partners that help to open doors and help us to better understand the lay of the land. But when you look at the education system, every single school district is different. Mm -hmm. And if we didn't have people who were on the ground to help us getting in there as community partners, and we didn't have an understanding fundamentally of how do you talk to a teacher, how do you talk to a principal, we lose out. But I think the one thing that we struggle with is we don't speak the same language as all of our partners speak. And so a lot of this over the past year has been saying, you know, corporations come in and we kind of have that um, uh, legacy of being bulldozers, right? One of the things that the previous superintendent was saying, if you tell the corporation they come in to do it, they're going to buy the iPads, they're going to be done. Well, we might not be the most thoughtful way to do it, but it'll get done, but we need the direction and how to get there. I think we're really looking to local organizations to be able to help us to say if community colleges where we think the strength of teaching financial literacy or something that would add value to, help us to help you get there. And I to really you. have, <laughs> right, we now have a partner. Um, but to really have people understand the value of the corporate community, both from a resource standpoint, because again, I think much more we come with people saying, can we have dollars? Mm -hmm. And I think that's important, and that's certainly a significant part of our commitment. But again, we have 160,000 people around the world, 37,000 here in every single state. What do you want us to do? Mm -hmm. we, can, we can be teachers. We can help teach the teachers. We can help teach the students. We can have pro bono come in and help your IT and the things that you're doing. Ask us because we don't necessarily know where we fit best. And so I think without those partnerships, it would just be a very nice round number and goal, but it wouldn't actually mean anything because we wouldn't know how to implement. Yeah. Um, Carrie, a lot of what Shannon just talked about in terms of relationships and community reminds me of some 
things that we discussed last night. Uh, there are a myriad of opportunities out there in terms of the investments you can make. And um, Carrie is an, a pretty phenomenal strategic philanthropist. Uh, Carrie is with the Mortgage Family Foundation. And I know you've shared with me that your inbox and voicemail are filled on a daily basis with uh, requests for funding and partnerships. Um, <laughs> You've said that a grant from the Mortgage Family Foundation can be the greatest gift or the worst curse. Tell me a little bit about, first of all, what it is that qualifies a school, a district, or an organization to be a Mortgage Family Foundation grantee, and then what that relationship looks like once it's brought to fruition. Sure. So, um, hi, everybody. Welcome um, to the end of the day. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's really important to know that um, we got started because my father-in-law took a company called Cisco Systems Public, and it's been a really great, phenomenal journey. And in that, um, my mother-in-law is an educator. So we decided as their spin-off, we're a spin-off foundation of their foundation, I think it's important for you to know that my mother-in-law was a special ed teacher, mm. and we got the teaching bug, and when they decided to set up our foundation, they um, asked us which, which arena we would like to be in and we chose education. So that's a big part of kind of how we got shaped. And as we dove into the education arena, and now fast forward 14 years, we A, look for leadership first. Um, Alberto Carvalho might be a great um, example of what fabulous, amazing leadership is. And that's who we're investing in. We look for that leadership piece first because it's only then that we know that our dollars, A, will get leveraged. So um, I'm no accountant, but when he took our million dollars <laughs> and he made it into a half a million, a half a billion, whatever you said in your math, that works for me. <laughs> so he took our million to the seven million times 10 is 70 million and you take your extra bond money and you double that and you triple that and that's what we're looking for. So because we only have a little, we're, we're like mortgage light. <laughs> So we're the kids. <clears throat> so we have to be really, really strategic of where we put our money. And it has to make a difference. So what we really learn, on top of investing in leadership and on top of investing in um, leverage, is that we always look now for a school that we can make a huge difference in mm -hmm. and make that the demonstration school. So in Denver, Colorado, we've um, invested in Denver School of Science and Technology. And it's become our number one STEM school. And it's, I think, the number one STEM school in the country. Um, mm -hmm. the, Bill Kurtz was just here again. He won, won on Oprah Winfrey. But what we learned from that is if you do it right and you build it well and you have phenomenal leadership, they will come. So, yeah. Thank you. That's great. I could go on and on and yeah. on, but um, I know we've been sitting here all day, so. No, that's fantastic. Well, I think you're going to get a lot of emails about that. One yeah. million to it's half full. a billion. Yeah. Yeah. It's my, 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 call Alberta. <laughs> no pressure there. Um, Eric, I think, you know, Carrie touched on STEM. And according to MacArthur Foundation, 65% of today's grade school kids are projected to end up doing work that hasn't even been invented yet. Mm. And Siemens Corporation was recently named one of the top 50 most innovative companies. Um, and you are grounded in the constantly evolving fields of STEM. So what advice would you give to business leaders out there in terms of preparing the workforce of the future? Uh, good question. Uh, first of all, I think that's one of the reasons we are where we are today. I think, you know, I can remember back when I was in college, people saying, that computers were, were going to be a huge wave back when we were all using punch cards and everything. <laughs> and I was saying, well, that's the future. I'm not sure I want to be part of it. Uh, but you know, look where we are today. And so I, I think that forecast is probably pretty accurate. And uh, so the first thing I think I, the advice I would give to companies is, A, you know, we do a lot of innovation. We've been around for 160 years. Uh, we do a lot of training. Mm -hmm. Because as we innovate, uh, we spend a lot of time upgrading our training. Uh, we have hundreds of, of training programs. We use a lot of e-learning within the company, uh, digital training, and we're constantly upgrading that. And depending on the industry and the sector, we're upgrading it every couple of years, every two years, every three years, every four years. So you've got to keep training the workforce of today for the future. But you're, you're constantly growing and bringing new people in, so you have to do, you know, businesses need to do a much better job of communicating with the educators and also with government about where the market is going. You know, the old story about skating to where the puck's going to be, not where it is. And I think that's where we haven't done a very good job from the, the business community. Uh, and, and I think part of it is because companies have for years thought of this as a big secret. Mm. 
um, you know, I know where the businesses are going to grow. I know the new technologies, and I'll just keep it to myself and train people. Well, I think we've seen uh, that part of the equation doesn't work. On the other hand, uh, there's a lot of history out there working with educators, uh, talking to people about where the market's going to go, and educators saying, well, I think I know better mm -hmm. where the market's going to go, and so I'm going to keep these programs in place. And you know, I think, frankly, if you take a look at the U.S. education system, maybe the K through 12, I won't talk about community colleges, <laughs> uh, but universities certainly, um, they continue to churn out uh, a lot of graduates every year uh, in areas that there really are no jobs, and which is why we have a huge number of unemployed and underemployed uh, young people in this country. So I think we also need a radical change by educators to realize that the world's going in a different direction. And so I think it's the business's responsibility to communicate that more clearly. We probably need to find some intermediaries to help us mm -hmm. do that. Uh, but this isn't something that's going to change overnight. But it is going to be a radical change. And the only way you're going to be able to tell it's radical change is a lot of people are going to be deeply upset. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's when you know we're really getting at the right issue. So. Mm -hmm. um, Emily. Emily, as I mentioned, is with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And Emily, you lead their portfolio of digital courseware for middle and secondary schools. And you've recently been involved in a very innovative partnership with Facebook, um, the College Knowledge Challenge, and a few other partners. Tell us a bit about this. And you know, as Eric was talking a lot about college and degrees that students are getting there, to take a step back, how do you feel technology can improve access to college education? So I'm on the K-12 team at Gates, and we have a really ambitious goal. Our goal is for 80% of US students to graduate from high school ready for college by 2025. And even the most optimistic estimates put that at about a third of students currently graduating from high school ready for college. And it's a very low bar. It just means I can go to college and not require any remediation to be able to take up college level work. Um, so the team that I'm on focuses on personalized learning to achieve that. And simply, every kid gets what they need when they need it. For us, technology plays a huge role in that. Um, and it's going to enable thousands and, and ultimately millions of kids to get everything they need when they need it. And, in, and it's going to empower teachers in delivering that in real time through a variety of things, including real-time data and actionable feedback, through adaptive technologies that respond to what kids know and can demonstrate that they can do, and that help them master content and skill before they move on, as opposed to the traditional model in which everybody moves on, regardless of whether they've mastered it. So the majority of our work is focused around academic content and skill, but we also have a portion of our work that's oriented toward just the processes of going to college. And since we focus on low-income and first-generation college-going kids, that actually can be a huge barrier to getting to college. Um, imagine if no one ever told you how to get there and all, all you got was some information in senior year of high school if you happen to make it that far and possibly could go to college. It's an incredibly daunting challenge. Um, so what we've started to work on with Facebook is, is helping students with the college going process itself. How do you master that process? How do you know about it early on? How do you join a college going peer community? How do you understand what your options might be later on and start to put yourself on a pathway early, starting in eighth or ninth grade, to get there? Um, so with those goals in mind, we started to look at the research on where kids are and where they're already engaged in these activities. And I'm sure no surprise to this audience, uh, quite a few US teens are on Facebook. In fact, um, there's great data from the Pew Internet and American Life Project that shows that about 80% um, of teens are online. And of kids who are using social media, um, almost all of them are on Facebook. Um, and there's other research that shows that first generation college going students are using Facebook to seek out role models and find information from inside their networks about the college going process. So with so understanding that, we built the College Knowledge Challenge with Facebook. And so this is a $2.5 million grant competition that awarded um, $100,000 grants to build applications to help kids with the college going process. And they're all social applications. They all integrate Facebook in some way. They're deeply grounded in what kids' practices are and what their needs are. They're going to launch this fall. Um, and so our goal there is to provide kids not just with more information about these processes, but actually with specific actionable tools that they can take up in the places and the ways in which they are already going about this um, to, to increase their college going rates and their own efficacy and empowerment in the process. And so Facebook's been a tremendous partner because um, the things that we do really well um, which are knowing about education, working directly with a lot of schools, and our grant making um, ha actually leave a big hole in this space for us, which is the technical capacity and then the power of Facebook's platform 
Um, and so we partnered with them on this initiative to provide a range of supports. And from our side, that looks like the financial support and the programmatic support around app development. And from Facebook's side, it looks like a whole bunch of things um, ranging from promotion to technical support. Um, and, and including hosting some hackathons, one of which I just got back from, <laughs> which was pretty amazing. And what was so exciting and inspiring about this is it brought together the best of what Facebook has, which is these fantastic developers and amazing technical talent, and the reach that they have into that world with what we have, which is the reach, deep reach into the educational world and the programmatic expertise, and brought together 125 people for a day to build social applications to help kids with learning outside of school and with the college going process. And the results were Phenomenal. They only built for six hours, and I couldn't believe what they produced. Mm. Um, so fantastic all around, and it gives us a great opportunity to orient the best talent in Silicon Valley around really sticky, important problems in education. Yeah. Wow. I, I like to think that I'm close to being a digital native, but I realize that I'm not when I don't <laughs> really understand what a hackathon is. So. Um, so I have a question now for everyone on the panel. We have in the room hundreds of, uh, or over 100 educators and, and people from the education community. We also have online thousands of educators. What advice would you give to everyone who's tuned in today in terms of building relationships with the business community that could uh, bring to fruition a, a real strong partnership? Have at it. <laughs> you want me to start? I'll, I'll be happy to start. Perfect. So, um, I live in Denver, Colorado, and we have um, Colorado Succeeds, which is our business community just this year got together with great political will, and they formed this coalition. So they now have 1,300 businesses in Colorado, and they're focused on education. And they meet every month. So you can go on the website and see what our business community did, but it, it's already being touted as one of the best business community things that we could do. So now our business leaders, like Siemens, understands where our schools are at and mm -hmm. understands the gap. And so now our business community can step in in their own communities and start to help us fill that gap. So that, that's what we did. And you can go on the website and that source is free. Hmm. Shannon, I know we had talked a lot about this in terms of there right. being that kind of missed bit of communication, that there's need and there's uh, resources, but how do you connect them? And I think that's the biggest challenge. I, I think understanding that the corporations that are in your backyard are there to help. They're just uncomfortable or they don't know how to help and they don't know how to reach out. So I think having an appreciation of what's the right way to make that introduction. And what we're really learning is that's very different by individual city. And so having that appreciation of if you go to somebody, if you go to your principal, if you go to your superintendent and have them reach out to a corporation, chances are the corporation wants to talk to you because mm -hmm. there's something that they can do for you, whether it's from a resource standpoint, a pro bono standpoint, a loan staff standpoint, dollar standpoint, there's probably a way for them to be able to give back if we figure out how to make that initial connection. And some of it, and we had an event um, yesterday and, and a principal said, pick up the phone and call us. Mm -hmm. And so I think some of it's on corporations because we're like, call a principal? I mean, that seems scary. I mean, you can't just pick up a phone and call a principal. We all have those, you know, remember back. Um, but I think that that's really important that we figure out what that looks like. I think in addition, it's really looking at organizations like Discovery Education that already know how to get into those local teachers and the people that they're actually working with. We've worked very closely with Knowledge at Wharton High Schools because they're the ones who can convene teachers. And so they're the ones who can pull together. We now sponsor three teachers day, bringing together about 200 teachers at each one, then having virtual teachers be there. We couldn't do that because we wouldn't know what in the world to do to bring together a teacher and how to ask them to come. But an organization who has several thousand teachers that they steadily work with that they're already trusted on, reaching out to them as a partner to be able to make this huge, um, complex education system something that's smaller is something that really is helpful. So I think it's a combination of the organizations need to take some lessons of how do you work when you're trying to get a client? Right, what is that networking that you do to try to have an appreciation of the industry, to try to understand who your stakeholders are? I think companies need to look at the education system in the same way and have a very strategic focus about what that looks like. And that's going to totally change my market, which was a very harsh reality for us as we wanted to do one size fits all, which it doesn't, especially in the education system. And then also for educators to realize, you know, you, you want laptops, you want people, you need this. Gosh, there's a lot of folks out there that can fill some of those gaps. 
And some of it is about asking and about making sure that the ask is one that's a strategic ask so that the company feels like, how are they in the game with you? A lot of organizations, you don't want to just write a check and walk away. We're done with that, right? Been there, we've, you know, that was years ago where philanthropy was. We just want a table, we just want to write a check, and you know, we're never going to talk to you again. This is coming and saying, how can we work together? How can this partnership be something that, yes, come with some dollars, come with some people, come with some skills, so it's actually sustainable, so that next year you can still count on that corporation to come back. And so we have to break down that we don't know how to speak, you know, education speak and educators and, and I come, I'm the only non-educator from a long line of educators and, and every Sunday my father says, what's your company doing to help education? I'm like, I know, we're getting there, we're getting there. <laughs> but, you know, we have to figure out how these two work together and I think that that's incredibly vital and some of it's going to take some hit and misses and some cold calling, which, you know, it's important that we start to figure out how to make that happen. Mm -hmm. Dr. Pollard, you're sitting over there shaking your head mm. and nodding in agreement. And you are uh, someone from the education community who has built some very, very strong and successful partnerships with the private sector. What advice would you give to educators out there as they get started? Well, I, I think we have to understand that the relationship, in a true partnership, is a relationship. And, and in that, there is a period where you have to actually cultivate that. I think part of what we oftentimes make the mistake of doing is to say, one, we don't know how to sit down and have the conversations, but more important, we don't take the time to build the relationship. So I'm going to come in, I'm going to say, can you give me $50,000 for my iPad? <laughs> you know, I don't think of any, I, don't, I can't think of any other relationship in my life where I simply go in and say, can you do this for me mm -hmm. without having taken the time to build that relationship? So I think that's a part of it, to be very clear about what the outcomes are and what the needs are. I also am oftentimes struck by the fact that how paralyzed we can be in just even starting the conversations. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think, how do I get in? What's my access point? And I am finding more and more when corporations and private entities come to us, they simply say, let's sit down and have a conversation. And as we start to dream together, the reality is that we start to come up very clearly about ways in which we can start to do something to impact our community. But what's the shared mission? What's the, the shared outcome? What really is the intent that we're trying to do? And then moving from that point to figure out the nuances of that. Uh, I, I, I have a, a glorious, and I was, I was thinking about this story a minute ago, I have a glorious six-year-old little boy who just started uh, to learn how to swim. And we took him to a swimming lesson. The first lesson, the teacher had him in, and they kind of got him wet. And the next lesson we went in, they put, you know, had him put his mouth in. And uh, Miles got out the water, so went to the side and sat down. And we were like, we're freaking out. Like, what's going on? <laughs> and we walk over to him, and we say, what's going on, baby? He says, he said, First, they had me put my mouth in, then it's going to be my nose, then it's going to be my eyes, it's going to be my whole face, and I, I just can't do it. I mean, this is, he's six, and he tells me this. And I kept thinking about then the next day, I said, well, what would happen if we got Candace, a sitter, to work with him? And he said, I'll do that because I trust her. Hmm. Right? So I, I think that that part is that they, there's an inevitability. Yes, if you're going to go full in on a relationship, your whole face is going to get wet eventually, <laughs> but you have to do it part by part by part, <laughs> right? And at the end of that, the only way that that relationship really works, if there's a trusting part to that, right, that we can have an honest conversation and broker the relationship. So for me, I, I really, I, I, I more and more found out if I sit down knee to knee, that's where the relationships start. Very seldom do the relationships come by an email that goes back and forth. Very seldom does it come by sitting in a, a luncheon next to each other and, and just saying, oh, hey, how you doing? You know, can I send you a grant application? Can I call your, your voicemail? It really comes down to saying, can we sit down and talk and find out what your goals are and what my goals are and how we can build a community together. Yeah, that's fantastic. And let us know how your, how your son does uh, with the swimming once he gets his whole head under. <laughs> I think uh, my, my advice to educators, I think it really varies by the level of the, of the educator. So you know, we do a lot with K through 12 around the country. Uh, we do a lot of science days and other kinds of mm -hmm. uh, joint learning programs for where we, where we have a big facility and we have, for example, over 130 uh, manufacturing facilities around the country and we have over a thousand other locations including lots of R&D centers. Uh, we're happy to work with the local uh, community schools and things to uh, to run programs, which I think gets younger students really psyched up about what mm -hmm. you're doing with some of the technology. Um, we find the community college a particularly good vehicle for building much stronger partnerships and relationships, particularly to keep a steady pipeline of people coming to the various facilities with the, with the skills that we need for that facility 
and we can work with them to change that over time. So I would say, you know, if you're near a Siemens facility and you're a community college, uh, to your point, don't send an email. Go on down, set up a meeting. Uh, there's no one at our plants who, uh, plant managers and executives who aren't going to want to meet and talk about how you can help align better with the requirements of the facility. And I think then at the university level, we have a whole different strategy. We, we really have very strong relationships with a couple of dozen universities around the country. And we like to really pick schools where we can do uh, not just recruiting, but also joint R&D programs, mm -hmm. yeah. because then we get some of the best research universities in the world helping us to work on our problems. You get masters and PhD level students who engage directly with our technology, help advance it, and then oftentimes they want to come to work with us either in our research areas or in our operations. Uh, but we also do, you know, I think 1,500 internships mm -hmm. a year at Siemens. So we're looking for local community colleges and universities and colleges to intern um, students. And then finally, uh, we're one of the world's leader in industrial software. We have a software a company called Product Lifecycle Management, PLM, and we donate that uh, to schools all the way down to grade school, uh, middle schools, high schools, and universities, mm -hmm. community colleges. And that software is used to design everything from uh, cars, uh, cars, uh, aerospace rockets. The Mars rover was designed using our software. Mm -hmm. uh, cell phones and tablets, uh, thousands of products use that software. It's, we're one of the largest developers that in the world. And we donate that, that to schools so you can start training people up at a very early age, which doesn't just qualify you for your job at Siemens. 70,000 customers in the U.S. have our software and use that. And uh, we've so you know, hundreds of thousands of licenses and mm -hmm. seats for that software. So uh, understanding that, so we try to get that injected into schools at a pretty early age. So. Mm. It's great. And I think part of it is just to figure out how do we work together. And so I think yep. individually, corporations probably just like schools, right? You're kind of in your own silo and this is what I do and this is what my class does or this is what my school does. And I think a lot of times corporations think the same thing, right? Yeah. This is my mission, this is our goal. And I think that at some point we have to say, okay, this is what we're good at. <laughs> like we can teach financial literacy and, and that's where our dollars go and we're good at that. But we're not good at the technology arm because that's not what our company is. So how do we start working together? And I think that's one thing that ultimately can help educators, that you get a suite of people coming together saying, we can solve this, knowing that it comes from different areas. And then the same thing when you look at a school district. If you have people coming from the IT department and coming from the curricular department together to say, we're all looking at this. How together can we solve this problem? And then look to corporations. I think that has everyone looking at a partnership you know, within industries and, and to be able to help each other more broadly. And, and we, I think, have to push ourselves more to figure out what do those partnerships look like and how do we make sure that we're getting the best of what we do, but coupling that up with other organizations. Yeah. And those are multi, and what I think is interesting in both of the examples, if these are multi-pronged partnerships, they aren't mm -hmm. a partnership that has simply one aim and one outcome. It's a partnership that has uh, internship component, curriculum sharing, software sharing. It may be mentoring. It may be uh, curriculum enhancement, assessment and review. Faculty can come in and teach. I mean, so th that to me, a comprehensive partnership is far more effective and in the end reaches the aims much more effective than simply saying, oh, can you come and help me do this? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it has to have a layered approach and it's one that's built over time with true relationships about what the needs are. Yeah. I also have to say from a donor's point of view, there has to be a genuine gratitude and thank you to the mm. donor. Mm -hmm. And I think that's forgotten in the myth. So okay, how do I get how do I get to Gates? How do I get that Gates grant? Nobody right. ever said that. <laughs> <laughs> and then once you get that Gates grant and everybody's working and running, I think there's this thank you component that we see often and mm -hmm. I want to remind the educators in the room how awesome it is when a three year old or a pre K write you a little thank you note and it's a squiggly face and a head a head that's big. <laughs> yeah. There's just nothing more special than being thanked as the donor because we're also putting our um, volunteer time, we're putting our resources, mm -hmm. and we're putting our trust into your organization. So we really do appreciate the thank yous, and I just want to throw that on the table and just remind everybody how important that is to yeah. all of us. Yeah, it's really, it's a personal relationship. I think that's what we're hearing repeatedly, that it's it's a two-way street, and it needs to have that communication and that, that really deep relationship and that trust, as Dr. Pollard was saying. That, and that's a critical point. I, one thing I would offer to educators and institutions to think about 
how you develop your engagement services area. Uh, and I think this is critical. We certainly have people who go out to help build relationships. We have people whose job is to maintain the relationship. We have people whose job is to help express the gratitude and donor relate. That to me is a very important, important part of the work. And if you see this as simply saying this is a one-shot deal, it's about nurturing the relationship mm -hmm. and to have people who start it and who see it to the end and who help build it and continue to say thank you. And I think that is so critical as an infrastructure yeah. that a lot of folks just simply don't do. Yeah. So uh, now I'd love to turn it over to the audience uh, and take some questions. I'm sure that, that there are some out there. I know online we have some. Um, if I can pull it up using technology. <laughs> um, in the meantime, though, is there, are there any questions in the room? Yes, Alberto. Carrie, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> uh, anyone else in the room? Yes. Am I just loud enough? I know that when you are all investing in various programs, we've talked about a, a little bit about what success looks like from a relationship standpoint and when you decide to invest. But then there's always that moment when you decide to reinvest. And um, things aren't always necessarily black and white, as we've heard in many instances today, in terms of just what transformation looks like and what success in this transformation movement looks like. How do you evaluate whether or not a program was successful, given you know, so much gray area? And then how do you make those decisions about whether or not you want to continue to move forward on a path or take one of those emails and phone calls that fills up your box every day? So for us, that's really a two-pronged question. So um, first, figuring out what success looks like is something you define up front. If you wait until the end to figure that out, you will have done perhaps a bunch of great work. Um, I had a bunch of good ideas, but ne necessarily good ideas that worked. And so having clear outcomes from the beginning is absolutely critical for us. Um, for my portfolio, it's the impact on student learning and achievement. If they are not having, if kids aren't um, ha achieving learning growth at least as um, good as they would have with traditional instruction, it, you know, this is probably not an effective solution, at least for those purposes. Not the end of the world, great to try things, um, but having that to being very clear from the outcome is critical. And then the second question for us is a little bit different. Um, so there are times in which our grantees do fantastic work and actually um, get to the end of a grant and are off and running and are wonderful and need more money but don't necessarily need it from us. Um, Perhaps they need money from the private sector. Um, they're going to raise investment capital. Um, maybe they've actually developed a revenue stream or need some help building up their revenue stream, but that's not necessarily more philanthropic dollars. And so the question there for us often is, what is best for the work that needs to get done and for the grantee's long-term health? And so a lot of the work we do is around catalytic funding, relatively short-term, um, and helping organizations become stronger so that they actually don't need philanthropic dollars at the end. And so, um, so it's not the second time around always, are they going to do good work and have a great impact on students' lives? It's what's best for the organization? How are they going to continue on? And how do we make sure that we're applying dollars to the biggest problems and to the areas of greatest need um, and not either scaring away dollars from, from other people or other organizations um, and as well as making sure that we've always got a pool of funding available for things that other people wouldn't tackle? Mm. You know, today has really focused on the moral imperative of transforming education. And we have a question from Lisa in San Francisco. And she says, what are your goals? Why do you invest in education? So I, I'd love to know from a business perspective, from, from the corporations in the room, um, why do you invest in, in education? What is the business objective? Is it solely workforce development? Um, how would you answer that question? Well, I, I think, you know, people are the lifeblood of any business. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, you know, there's a, there's, there is a real war for talent out there, and we need to make sure we have the best people, but we also need to make sure that for a lot of our markets, we have the right people. Mm -hmm. So in a lot of cases, we're spending money. Uh, for example, we have one of the largest STEM competitions in the country, uh, high school juniors, uh, tens of thousands of applicants every year, uh, and we give out uh, money, scholarship money, to students all over the country. A uh, very few of those students over the past 11, 12 years have come to work at Siemens. Mm -hmm. But it really does a lot to promote and get people excited about STEM education and STEM projects and, 
and getting those high schools where a lot of those students are excited. So it, it builds the general level of interest around STEM. Uh, but a lot of our, you know, a lot of our investment is also targeted specifically at getting people who are going to be excited about the technologies we're developing, whether whether that's in the research and science area or in the operations area or or whatever. So, you know, I think, um, you know, it's it's really a first. I think it's a business imperative, and then I think it's it's also part of uh, you know community relations and development and and uh, just trying to uh, enhance the overall. Uh, competitiveness of the country. Mm -hmm. Great. Shannon? No, and, and I would definitely agree. I mean, I think we look at this twofold. One, when we, when we go in and again, um, as Elizabeth was saying, our focus is on financial literacy. When we go into a third grade class, we're not expecting someone to come out as an accountant. That's not going to happen. Um, you know, in the byproduct of what we're doing, maybe will somebody look at the financial services industry? Will somebody look at that? Maybe. But at the end of the day, we're professional services and we don't make anything. We're all about our people. So we're all about how to engage our people, how to want to make our people do more than what they do. And education is a way, because they've all been educated in some way, shape, or form, whether it's formalized or informalized, they've all gone through that process. And so to have them be able to give back to it, it's a natural give back. I mean, that's what we do. We're, you know, in not making anything and having these people that they want to do something that feels good to them. And so we're trying to put them in, um, focusing their efforts on what one thing could they all teach, but that memory of what it was like to actually have a light bulb go off, whether it was one topic or another, is something that's, that's so critical. And so what we do is we're looking at this really as overall helping the marketplace. And so when we look at what our role is in financial services, and when we look at what went on in the mortgage crisis, and we look at what's happened in the past, having a more financial literate marketplace workforce as a whole is going to be helpful to us, regardless if somebody comes and works at PwC. Because they're going to be at a client, they're going to be at a business, they're going to be at something where they're impacting the things that we do and the things that our people are somewhat associated with. And so it can't just be about people are coming to come back to work for us. As Eric was saying, it's a combination of things. I think companies have multiple different things that they're looking at. It's a war for talent, certainly, and we're looking at the skill set. And yes, byproduct, have we gotten some students that are now interested in this? Absolutely, but it can't be just for those reasons. I think it also has to be that we're trying to create a better world in which we live and a better marketplace as a whole. And if you go into it looking like that, it's a lot more of what you can see that's sustainable. Because if you get to a time where you ultimately have too many people, then why are we going to keep doing this if we don't need them? They all have the skill set. So it has to be for something that's outside of that as well. And I do think the corporations are trying to figure out what is the layered approach to why all these different avenues are actually important. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other questions from the audience? <coughs> We're getting close on time. All right. Well, thank you, panelists, for being here today. This was really a wonderful conversation uh, and very helpful, I think, in terms of the broader education community uh, perspective. So if we can give our panelists a round of applause. <laughs>